good morning. Okay, we're starting uh, chapter seven on mag magnetostatics. Um, this is uh, deals with the study of magnetic fields set up by uh, DC currents or steady currents. Um, and then we will actually in a later chapter, although we don't have much time left, I think we still have chapters eight and nine, and, and we'll look at fields uh, created by time varying currents. Um, but there are some um, interesting parallels between magnetostatics and electrostatics. This is from a, a table in your textbook. Um, and this is called duality. So in electrostatics, we deal with the, the field intensity is E. In magnetostatics, it's H. We have densities, flux densities in both. So we'll be calculating the flux of a magnetic field. That's, that's the, the flux density is D, whereas in electrostatics it's D. And you get the various material relationships that we've looked at in the past. We've actually looked at the force on a charge uh, very early in the semester, chapter one or chapter two. There's two forms of Ohm's, or Ohm's laws, but Maxwell's equations. There, there are four equations that make up Maxwell's equations. But typically they're stated in this differential form. Um, these will be modified a little bit um, when we start uh, taking into account time uh, variation. Um, so, but for the, the static case, this is Maxwell's equation. And so these are the four equations that underlie you know, all of electromagnetic theory. You know, it's probably it's the biggest contribution to you know, physics any time in, in the last several hundred years was the development of these four equations. They're fundamental to almost all of modern electrical engineering and, and physics. So um, we've already looked at these two. We'll uh, look at del dot B today, uh, Gauss's law for, magnet for magnetostatics. And then also we have similarities and the boundary conditions, which we'll get to. And then we'll also, the, uh, we'll talk about inductance in this chapter. But one of the reasons I wanted to point that out is there really aren't any new vector equations that we'll be dealing with. We've seen them all at this point in some form or another when we were looking at electrostatics. I know they're not easy to 
interpret, but you know, we will look at them again. Now, Gauss's law for magnetic fields, which abbreviate as GL and um, and this is this is in the integral form. There is a differential or point form that's more useful uh, for more complicated problems. The integral form is can be used to find the B field when there's a lot of symmetry, just like Gauss's law for electrostatics. Uh, if this is a little bit simpler than the corresponding equation we had for uh, electrostatics, we had D dot DS is equal to the charge enclosed okay, over the closed surface. So B here is the magnetic flux density. So the units are Weber's per meter squared, or that's equivalent to a, a Tesla. Kind of prefer the, the, the Weber's per meter squared because when we integrate that over an area, we get we get the, the Weber's, which is our magnetic flux. And then the note that the integration is over a closed surface. And this can be one of the more difficult things to remember as you're dealing with these equations. You know, is it a closed surface or a closed contour? A closed surface encloses a volume. Whereas a closed contour bounds an open surface. And we deal with both types, right? So, you know, we, we can deal, we'll deal with surface integrals, which typically, you know, are over open surfaces um, bounded by a contour, and then closed surfaces, which are the, the, the surface area of, of a corresponding volume. The interpretation of this says, you know, we interpreted the electric flux density, the, the D field, as um, um, this surface integral was equal to the charge enclosed within the surface or inside the corresponding volume. Here, this states the fact that this is zero is there is no net flux through any closed surface. So any flux lines entering the closed surface or volume have to leave. Unlike with, you know, if we had a volume that contained like a positive charge, that positive charge was a source of flux, right? We could have flux lines coming out from that point charge and leaving the surface. This says there is no, for magnetic fields, there is no equivalent particle or point that is a source of magnetic flux lines. Okay. Another way to interpret that is all magnetic field lines are actually closed loops. So electric field lines can start at a positive charge and end at a, at a corresponding negative charge. Or you know, if we enclose a negative charge, our electric field lines go into the surface. Okay. There's nothing like that. There is no magnetic particle that is a source of magnetic field lines. Moving current creates magnetic field lines, and we'll see that they're associated, that our, our magnetic field is associated with a current, but our magnetic fields don't actually start and end or start at a point. Magnetic field lines are closed loops. So, and you guys have seen you know, pictures of magnets 
where I'll draw a few representative field lines, but they are always shown as, or should always be shown, sometimes they're shown starting on the north end of the bar and ending on the, but they actually continue through the material. They are always closed loops. There is no, there's no starting or ending point for B field lines. And a, a fundamental difference between the magnetic field and the electric field. So let's look at, in the integral form, and we'll come back to the integral form in just a bit, I'll, I'll work through an example. It's useful in problems that involve uh, a lot of symmetry, a differential point form um, can be used to find the field in, in more complicated problems, but from the divergence theorem, The divergence theorem allows us to equate a flux integral to a corresponding volume integral. So the right hand side is the calculation of flux, so is the left hand side. It says that the flux of the B field to a, a closed surface can be found by integrating the divergence of the field over the corresponding volume. There, there, this, is, this is a general vector calculus result, right? It's the divergence theorem. It applies for any vector field. Okay? It's a mathematical identity. Um, but the right-hand side is equal to zero from GLM, and since this has to hold for an arbitrary volume, the argument is that the divergence of the B field has to be equal to zero. So this is, and this was in that table that I showed a few minutes ago, this is one of Maxwell's equations. The divergence of the B field well, actually, this is one of the Max Maxwell's equations too, in, in integral form. That's that's the differential form. If you, again, if you remember, del dot d, the electric flux density is equal to the volume charge density. D, which is another way of saying that you know, volume charge is a source of the D field. This is another way of saying is there is no point source or the magnetic field, that the field lines are, are closed. Amper's circuital law uh, which is ACL, it's not, it's not the same ACL great when you're falling down the stairs or running. Um, but uh, Amper's circuital law actually allows us to find the magnetic field from current. So again, this, this is one that we'll be using, um, provides a relationship between the, the H field and the, and the B field, if you remember, B and H are just related by a multiplicative constant, the permeability of the material. Okay, so if we have the H field, we can get the we can get the B field uh, just multiplied by the perme permeability. So this is this is ACL in integral form. There is a there is a corresponding um, point form that uh, uh, we'll look at. Actually, it's one of Maxwell's laws. 
H here is the magnetic field intensity. And it has units since H times distance has to equal current, H has units of amperes per meter. Now, and the integration here is over a closed contour, so, which is bordering an open surface. So it says if you know, we have current, and we'll use this typically uh, around a wire, but you know, if we have current flowing through a wire, and it may not be uniform, it could have this, this current density, then we can take a uh, closed loop around the wire, or whatever is carrying the current, to create this contour. So the contour, the closed contour, bounds an open surface. And so we can use Stokes theorem to come up with an uh, equivalent of uh, point form. So uh, there's, there is a uh, right-hand rule uh, to make sure you're doing the contour integration so you don't get it. Otherwise, you'll end up with a, a minus sign. You'll end up with a negative of the current. So if you um, uh, curl your fingers around the loop in the direction of the current flow, then your thumb will be pointing in the, in the direction of the contour integration. Okay. So with the current flowing up like this, I have to integrate in a counterclockwise rotation around the contour. If the current is flowing down, I'd have to integrate, do that contour integral um, in the opposite direction. So let's actually look at this. To find the field for it's 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 an infinite wire. So it's kind of like you know, there's some classic problems here that you'll find the results in the textbook, just like for the electric field. You know, we had we had uh, a point charge, okay? and then we had an infinite line of charge. It wasn't moving, but an infinite line of charge. We also looked at you know spheres of charge and planes of charge. Those are all classic problems in which we can use symmetry to to derive the corresponding electric field. There are similar problems that you run into now in magnetostatics. Okay? The first one here being this case of an infinitely long wire. And the symmetry, we're going to put the, the wire along the z-axis. And I'm just going to show a segment of the wire and it's infinitely long, but it takes me too long to draw an infinite length wire. So it has radius A. And then to apply Amper's law here, I'm going to, I'm going to surround the wire with a, a loop. And I'm going to have the current flowing up. So my direction of integration would be in that direction. And I'm going to have it be a perfect circle. Again, it's a, it, this is an artificial loop. I mean, it, it's not a loop of wire. It's just a, a contour around that, that I'm going to integrate. So it's just an imaginary circle around this wire. 
Now, in order to proceed, well, let me, let me give you. The equation from Mrs. Amper's circuital law. Um, in order to proceed, though, we have to make some symmetry arguments. You know, we're, we're trying to actually find H, the integrand, um, based on the value of the interval. Now, normally, you can't do that, right? You, there are a number of different functions that you can integrate to get the result 10. So essentially what I'm trying to do here is you know, go from the result of the integral and then figure out what the integrand is. Normally, again, you can't do that except under certain circumstances, in this particular case, where there's a, a great deal of symmetry. So by symmetry, H can not depend on Z or P. And because the thing is infinitely long, it can't depend on Z because as we move up the wire, we've still got an infinitely long wire above us, an infinitely long wire below us. And that picture is the same no matter what our height is. Same is true, you know, as we go around this thing, you know, looking back toward the center. There's nothing, the, the, the symmetry says that the picture we see is the same regardless, you know, of that, of that angle. Uh, one that's a little harder to buy, but I'm asking you to accept it. Um, we'll prove it later on using uh, a law called the, the Biot-Savar law is similar. There can't be a Z component to the field or this one may be a little harder to buy or a row component. Now here I'm saying the field magnitude can't depend on Z or V. Here I'm saying that you know, it's a vector field and saying it can't have a Z component either or actually a row component. So it means that our field has to be be directed and has to circle around our wire. And it can only depend on the distance from the wire, the magnitude of the field. So this is not H times rho in parentheses. This is saying that the magnitude of our H field can only be a function of that radial distance. So <clears throat> plugging into that result, so we got P H rho. Um, actually, let me, let me just show we don't confuse that as multiplication by rho. We change my notation. It's called H sub subscript rho. And then that's dotted with rho dv. Well, uh, that's, there's no phi dependence here. Phi dot phi is, is one. So I get just two pi rho H of rho. Now, for rho greater than A, the amount of current so in, uh, enclosed by our loop is just equal to I, the current flowing in the wire. I enclosed is equal to I. And we have from Amper's law, 2 pi rho H rho is equal to I, or H rho is equal to I, 2 pi rho. Or going back to my H field, which was H rho times my phi unit, the vector, I get 2 pi rho, or rho greater than A. Okay. 
So this is the magnetic field intensity around the, around the wire. Now it's entirely feed directed. Okay, so with, with my current going up, so here's another right hand rule. If you put your thumb in the direction of the current, the, the magnetic field will, will be in the direction of your fingers. So thumb pointing up the magnetic field will be going clockwise around this, counterclockwise around this wire. So, um, but it says, as I get farther away from the wire, the magnetic field intensity gets smaller. because we've got, we've got rho in the denominator here. It is proportional to I, the, the, the stronger the current, the more current we have, the stronger the, the magnetic field intensity. Now, <laughs> we can actually, also find the magnetic field within the wire. So here are the cases rho less than A. Um, what changes, this integral actually doesn't change at all. What changes is the amount of current enclosed. And I'm going to say that you know, the, the current density is, is constant across that cross section. It's just I divided by that cross sectional area, which means, so now I'm thinking about a little loop that's smaller in radius than my wire. So the current enclosed would actually be the ratio of those areas. It would be um, pi rho squared over pi a squared. So pi a squared is the total cross section of, of the wire. Pi rho squared is now the little area of my surface enclosed by my contour when the contour has radius less than a. So the current, and this becomes i when rho is equal to a. So this is i rho squared over a squared. And as rho goes to zero, the amount of current enclosed by my loop is, is also zero. So inside the wire, I have two pi rho h rho is equal to i rho squared a squared, or h rho is i rho two pi a squared, one of the rows cancels there, or again, putting the result together for my H field, it's I rho two pi A squared, or this is for rho less than A. So usually you'll see it written in a textbook like this, to summarize, It's I rho over two pi A squared for rho less than A. And it's I over two pi rho for rho greater than A. Now, in the homework I signed today, in a couple of problems, you're dealing with this infinitely long wire. You don't have to rewrite this result every time. You can use this result to, to answer the problems. Okay, so again, this is one of those, those classic situations like a sphere of charge or uh, a charged plane where it, um, we have the result for an infinitely long wire. And you can extend this using superposition. Maybe you have multiple wires in parallel with currents flowing in opposite direction. So if, if the currents are flowing, if I had a parallel wire with the current flowing up here next to it, this wire with the current flowing up, the H field would be directed into the board here between the two wires. If I had another wire parallel to it with I going up, my, my fingers are coming out of the board and here in between the H field would be weaker. 
But if the, in the parallel wire, if the current were flowing down, I would get reinforcing H fields between the two wires. They would both, the H field would both stop in both cases would be going into the wire. Um, we can kind of get an idea of what the intensity of the H field looks like here. For rho less than A, this is just a linear function of rho. So it's zero. And then the limit here when rho is equal to A, this is just a straight line. And when rho is equal to A, it would reach a peak of I over two pi A. Okay, when rho is equal to A. For rho greater than A, notice it starts at the same point. When rho is equal to A, we still have I over two pi, two pi A, but it has this inverse relationship now. And so for rho greater than A, the field's gonna look like that. It's a one over rho relationship. And going toward zero here is as rho gets larger and larger. Okay, but it is a it is a continuous function. And also remember that we can find the magnetic flux density is just uh, rho times h. Um, okay, so let's do an example problem. So this is kind of typical for, for the problems here. So um, here we're given an infinitely long wire. And we're told the wire has a radius of five millimeters. And we're given the B field is U0, J0, rho for rho less than A. So that was going to correspond to this. So if you'll notice, I divided by two pi A squared is actually our current density. So this is just an, and then B is mu times H. So this is equivalent to this statement. It's just written in a slightly different form. I divided by the area is going to be J zero. And they give us J zero is 127.3 amps per meter squared. They ask us to find I. So essentially all that we need to do using the result that's given is we know that I rho over two pi A squared, which is our formula for um, H inside the wire, Actually, I need to multiply by mu zero to get, has to be equal to the B field, mu zero, J zero, rho. Okay. Or I, I can cancel my mu zero and my rho. Again, I, I get J zero, the current density is I divided by two pi A squared. So I is, is nothing more than J zero times two pi A squared. Okay. That it could have actually got that just knowing in this case that the current density is constant across the wire. So just multiply by the area of the wire to get the current. So, but bless you. So this becomes um, 127.3 times two pi, and then A is five millimeters. And if I plug that in right, I get 20 milliamps for the, for the current. <clears throat> Which way is the current? flowing in the wire. I did draw the arrow here. 
Can you tell from the direction of the B field? So if this is Z, X, X and Y, the B field is in the B direction. Remember in, in polar coordinates, V is always at 90 degrees to your row. So the, the fee, uh, fee field, would, uh, this is actually inside the wire for the problem, but you know, so it's, it's counterclockwise directed inside the wire. It's also counterclockwise directed outside the wire. Okay, it's just a little easier for me to, to draw this. So now which, which way is I flowing? Up or down? It'd be going up. Put your fingers in the direction of the field. The current would be going up. If this were minus V here, you know, and these were all positive values, and I had a minus sign, then the V field would be directed in the opposite direction and the current would be flowing down. All right, that's that's it for today. So call it an early day. And then uh, continue on Monday.